social media in the beginning is free. So whether you are at your highest level, you can go farther if you're not really using it. And if you are just starting out looking for your first deal, it costs you nothing and you can build your entire business on it. I don't care if you're shy, yeah. get up here and talk to people, smile, look them in the eye. And it was just preached to me. So you can do it. These are just fun things people would love. It's stupid. You could not pay me to start brokering deals again. This is what we're doing. I believe it's best for me. I believe it's best for you or I wouldn't be taking you there. And here's why. And we're going and I hope you're coming with us. All right, you guys, welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to the channel and you want to know everything about making money in real estate, selling sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below, tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. Yep, and we get calls, texts, and emails every day from people just like you, and we absolutely love it. So whether you're new in the business or looking to grow, give us a call, shoot us a text, or uh, send us an email. All right, the suspense is killing me. We're super excited to have with us today, Tammy Pack. Tammy Pack, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, I'm so excited. Yeah, why don't you give yourself a quick intro? Tell us a little bit about you know how you got into the business, what you're working on today, and we're really excited to hear about your book that's coming out. Yeah, thank you, I'm excited. Um, glad to be here. I graduated from law school in 1990, so that was my early path in life I was going to take. I practiced as a trial attorney for five years, then decided I wanted to go into retail, opening up stores, being an entrepreneur, basically. And honestly, that wasn't really different than selling real estate. Sales and owning your own business, which each of us does, is all really tied in together. So it kind of morphed over time. It went from uh, owning retail stores. We had six at one point that we'd made in these cute little tourist towns and then started. I've always loved real estate. So I started buying these little cottages and you couldn't long term rent them really in Fredericksburg, Texas, where I live uh, for enough money because they were kind of expensive even 28 years ago. But I figured out back then they called them little B&Bs. Mm -hmm. So Fredericksburg, Texas was Airbnb when it didn't exist. So they're like, no, it's just a little cottage in your yard and you rent it out for the night to the tourists. And so we started that in 2001. Time went on, we added doors. We got up to 26 doors at one point and thought, you know, we should really be taking our own reservations. We've already got retail. We've got employees, cash registers, phones, stores on Main Street. Let's just do it ourselves. So instead of paying a reservation service, we started doing it ourselves. That was in 2007. So that's when Absolute Charm b, &B Reservations was born. Awesome. Very soon after that, people started going, I like your website better. Would you take my b, &B? So we went from having my 26 rooms to right now, last I checked, we have 206 wow. properties. We, we take reservations for on the b, &B side. Right. Then in 2015, I married my husband, Wes, and I had my license, my real estate license since 09, but just for my own deals. Because honestly, there were a lot of less than very competent realtors to work with. And what I found is they were getting in the way of my deals versus <laughs> facilitating my deals. And I was handing them things and saying, don't change anything. Please don't make them mad. Don't have my back. Just make the deal smoothly go through. So I got my own license to be polite. That way I didn't have to break up with my realtor. I was like, oh, sorry, I got my license, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, but I turned that away. I'm like, I cannot do B&Bs, b, &Bs, b, &B reservation service, retail stores and going to real estate as a business, right? Married my husband, Wes, in 2015. I was like, but I'm trying to get him to come here to live because he was 100 miles away in Georgetown, Texas, near Austin. And I said, let me tell you the business I've turned away for years, real estate. Yeah. So we said, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. So he and I just gotten married. Um, he got his license. And 2015, we started, we got married and started Absolute Charm Real Estate Group. In 2018, we joined EXP. So we just became... Well, so I should say we were Absolute Charm Real Estate. Yeah. Then in 2018, we became Absolute Charm Real Estate Group, yep. broker by EXP Realty, right? So nothing really changed. It was amazing. Our colors stayed the same. Our personality stayed the same. We just had a lot of great brokerage support at that point. So in under three years, we were really fortunate and we worked really hard to become the number one team, number one volume grossing team ever in our MLS. And we've been really lucky to, to stay in the top position since that time with a lot of hard work and unique marketing. And so here we are today. I think we have 19, I think 20 joining on the, on the team now. So that's kind of who we are. That's awesome. Fantastic. 
So that basically from 2015 till now, so that's, uh, we're talking eight years. Yes, we have done a lot of real, a lot of water under that bridge in eight years. <laughs> you know, real estate ages you right, so I'm only 19. I just look at some of the real estate. <laughs> that's incredible. incredible. <clears throat> what are some of the lessons that you've learned or that you've seen from owning the B&Bs coming into real estate that were similar, that was easy for you to adapt? Well, you know, it, it's it's all the same thing. It all just ties in once you get into an area that's got a lot of synergy. So I wanted to own real estate, most importantly. Still, I want to own real estate, most importantly. So I, I constantly feed my mind with podcasts such as yours, such as Bigger Pockets, the real estate CPA. I'm listening all the time, so it's reminding me, are you out buying real estate? Are you buying? Because I think agents need to remember one way we can best help our clients is if we believe in the product we're selling. Yeah. Right. We need to. Now, I know you got to start somewhere, but as soon as you can make it happen, get creative. Mm -hmm. You need to own a home. If that means you need to house hack and get in there with the FHA 3.5 and rent out the bedrooms, then you house hack. But you want to be able to. My husband likes to say, uh, bathe with the soap you sell. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to know mm -hmm. it as an and even go further, you got to know it as an investor, yeah. right? So when I talk to people, I earn their credibility, the, their respect, because they see the credibility, because I'm not talking about something I learned in a class. I'm talking about something I do. Yeah. And I get it. People can be, y'all laugh at this. So y'all are way too young. So back in the day when I was more in y'all's age range, we'd watch TV. We didn't have something called the internet. So I'd watch these TV infomercials and this fella by the name of, Carlton Sheets would come on and he would sell his course for buy real estate with no money down. And I was like, boy, I would like to be able to do that. I, I got to figure this out because I owned a home, right? We, we can all save up our down payment and we can buy some real estate, but we can't go fast enough. We can't buy enough. If the only option is great. Okay. Now start saving again. Mm -hmm. Come back in three and a half years when you've saved another down payment. So it wasn't that I didn't have money, wasn't making money. I wanted more and I didn't want to save. My mom used to tell me real estate's where money's made. Appreciation selling, rolling it into things. She said, you're never going to be able to save that much money. It's going to take you forever. Nickel and diamond, you can't get there. It's not enough. Yeah. So you start and then you start rolling it. I got this course from him. I learned about creative financing, how to find sellers who are, in a position where they would like to do a little sell or carry back. Maybe they don't want all their capital gains up front. Maybe they want to make a little interest when their CDs aren't making anything. So you learn to think differently. And that was the most important thing to me. And I've done it over and over. This is what you'll think probably is funny about this. Back then he would sell his course and they'd be like, call the number on the screen, 1-800, <laughs> no money down. Or whatever. Yeah. So I called, I got the course, I watched, I internalized I forgot what all it said, but I know that that's where it started. And guess what I did earlier today? I went on eBay and I searched Carlton Sheets and I found a vintage set of VHS tapes with workbook and it is on its way to me. That's going to make some great video. <laughs> nice. Let's go see what Carlton was saying back in uh, 1992. <laughs> it's probably all still relative. Yeah. Like, uh, the, the basic skills, you know? A hundred percent. You know, people are afraid to ask. They're afraid to get creative. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times when I speak about real estate, I spend a lot of time talking about buying real estate because it's twofold. Mm. You need to understand those things from the mind. If, if, you, if you said, Tammy, I'm never owning real estate. I think you're crazy. I'm just going to sell it. OK, you still need to understand how someone who buys real estate thinks. Yeah. Right. You've got to get in their mindset. And then number two, I don't know if I've ever re really met a realtor who one of their top goals wasn't to, for them to buy more real estate. Yeah. Yeah. They see these deals. They watch the appreciation. They go sell it. And they're like, man, I got to get in on this. But they're afraid to think outside the box. Yeah. So that would be my biggest tip is you got to get creative. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. The It's interesting because it takes us a while to realize that that's really where wealth is built. You can use retail, like residential sales as an ATM machine to fund the lifestyle of owning and being an investor. Yeah. Um, and, and just to understand your thought process through this. So from 2015, as you started in the real estate space, although you were licensed since 2009, how was your first year or two years? What, what did they look like? Well, it's kind of funny because my husband and I spent 
the first half or two thirds of the year thinking about our logo and our colors. <laughs> we were also at retail stores going downtown. We're running. We got the B and B service. We got a lot going on. So, and we did have one advantage, all you know, in, in all transparency, one advantage of being a little older is we had the B and B side of the business paying our mortgage mm. and our gas, right? So you can always use more money, but we weren't like depending on are we going to be able to buy groceries. So we said, let's just live conservatively and let's uh, throw everything we can into marketing. Mm. So how it looked is our first year, 2015, we had three sales. Two of them were our personal properties, a buy and a sell. And, and they were in November, okay? So I was sitting in bed with a laptop like I do. My husband hates it, but I'm like, I, you know, go to sleep. I got my laptop. I'm doing stuff. I'm, I'm working over here, you know? And he goes, what are you doing? I said, I just listed the downtown building for sale for two and a half million dollars. He goes, you, you did what? And I was like, yeah, I think it's a good price. And what a great listing to have when you're starting out. There's no, you know, in 2015, nothing ever for sale downtown. What a great listing. And if it sells great, if it doesn't, at least we got something in the books. Well, it sold. Mm. We got a lot of traction from that. We bought something else and we sold one other property that year. But what was funny is I started getting the idea early on that it was all about social media. This started becoming clear to me because my husband and I had just gotten married and I realized everyone was looking on our Facebook, talking about the wedding, the great wedding in Paris and the photos. And we seem so happy. I'm like, hmm, people are looking at us. Maybe we should start talking about this real estate business while they're looking. Mm. And so I started kind of playing with that and everyone gets hung up on their business page with no one gives a rip about. They only care about your personal profile. I know you got to have the other thing, but do you care about your local plumber's page putting no. ads up on? No, you could not care less. If, you're, if your toilet's not clogged, you don't care right now, right? Sure. So the best thing you can do Excuse is be the plumber that's always the friendly, helpful, cool plumber. And when your toilet gets clogged, you remember his name and his face. Yeah. Then yep. you call him. So that's what we did. We took those three sales and we made people think we were selling everything. I will never forget a guy, a friend from church who was a realtor, came over and said, y'all are killing it. We had not had one closing. And I said, yeah, we are. Man, it's nuts, going crazy. Because I would take a picture of the listing from the front. I would take pictures inside. I would show our sign. I would show Wes hammering in the listing sign. People don't pay attention or care if every one of those is a different listing. They're glancing. And so we took True. what we were doing and amplified it with social media and perception is reality. And everyone said, man, y'all are killing it. Therefore, we were killing it. And it just grew. Agents were coming in going, how are we gonna compete with your marketing? We just can't. And so um, we would like to join the team. So we grew without having to work hard at it in that way, meaning all of our focus was on marketing. Everybody else, I don't know you guys what's going on in your area, but here everybody still puts ads in the back little real estate section with one and a half point type. I don't know, you can't read any of it. And that's what that's what people do, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, if we're gonna spend any money, we're gonna spend more money and we're gonna do a quarter page ad in the front sections in color. And we might only have one listing, but it's gonna be a beautiful layout. And next week it's gonna be all about us and our background. And we don't have to necessarily do that now, but to build the brand, that's what we did. Wherever somebody was over here, we went over there. We had a VIP party when I think we probably had four clients, but we invited a hundred people who we had this beautiful space and we said, these are our future VIPs. These are our future clients. We want you to be there. And you just start that buzz, right? And so the, what I love about it, and I tell people, social media in the beginning is free. So whether you are at your highest level, you can go farther if you're not really using it. And if you are just starting out looking for your first deal, it costs you nothing and you can build your entire business on it. I love it. And that's where the personal branding came in naturally more than anything else. Yes, sir. And I tell people, they go, yeah, but you have this going for you or you have that. Everybody's got an excuse. Yep. I'm like, people tell me constantly, but Tammy, I don't know what my story is. I said, well, you're not listening to people. They're telling you what your story is. Hmm. People were telling me, you have never looked so happy since you met Wes. This is so great. They wanted to hear more of that. Everyone I walked into said it. They are telling you, you're the best soccer mom ever. How do you sell real estate? And somehow you got those two kids in the back of the car and you're here doing it. They're telling you 
what they see. And you will find a consistent theme if you listen mm. that you're told over and over. I tell one of my agents, she's like, I don't know my story still. I don't know. I don't want to do video. I don't like the way I look in video. We're always saying, you know, you look like that in real life. We see you in real life. Yeah. I don't like, I'm like, oh, look at this angle. Guess what? You're seeing me in real life. Mm-hmm. Get over it, man. Yeah. And I said, your angle is you live on a ranch in Texas. You are a lady by yourself going out in your big snake boots, feeding cattle. Yeah, you're right. You don't have a story that's interesting. <laughs> you know, things I can't even dream about doing. People tell you, I'm, I admire how you take care of that land. You know things that I don't know. Share little snippets. Show us the names of the cattle, whatever it is, stuff that city slickers like me just don't know. And people will love your story. Your tribe will like your story. Right? Yeah. You guys know this, right? I'm preaching to the choir. There's a, a really good book. It's called Psycho Cybernetics by uh, Maxwell Maltz. It talks about like self identity and being able to see yourself. And um, there's a person who said it recently. I don't know exactly who it was. They say our life and the way that we live it isn't the way that we think it is. It's the way that we think others think we think about it. So being yes. able to cr- create that story as well. So even if you don't have a story, you can create it from scratch. And as long as you're creating that perception that people think it is, then you're going to be able to think. You're going to live I got you. essentially. You get that, no, that whole you're, circle. You're, you're so right. And, and you know what I tell people? They always go, well, you're outgoing. You're all this. I do it because I choose to do it. Yeah. I'm just as happy sitting alone and not leaving my house for three days. I really am. I We all do what we choose to do. And I did have the world's smartest mother had no education. But she pulled me out behind her legs every day and said, quit hiding behind me. Make eye contact. You ain't going to get nowhere standing back there. You got, I don't care if you're shy. Yeah. Get up here and talk to people. Smile, look them in the eye. And it was just preached to me. So you can do it. And I said, you don't have to be super outgoing because guess what? Half of the people out there are three fourths aren't. And they're going to look at me and say, whoa, you're way too much for me. Yeah. So if you're a little more reticent, guess what? A lot of the people listening to you are too. And they're like, yeah, that's my speed. That's the realtor. I can relate. Yeah. So I've given people so many ideas, never seen anyone do one yet. <laughs> I said, if I'm starting from scratch and I have no idea and I'm scared spitless and I don't think I'm outgoing, I'd be like, y'all, I am the world's worst cook. I can't cook anything. I need your help. I need you guys to give me, I'm going to do, I'm going to do five next week, Monday through Friday. Could give me your no fail recipe. The thing that I can't screw up. Yeah. I know y'all have them and we're going to do it live. I'm going to live this thing and oh, I won't put you through the whole thing. But as I put it together at the end, you get the point. Yeah. Get them in. People love to help. You're going to get inundated with recipes. Or I would say I want to do a five day challenge. I want you to help me come up with five recipes for next week. Each one has no more than five ingredients. Takes about five minutes to put together and I can buy it all for five bucks. Who has that thing that should be in everybody's pantry all the time? Company came over. Oh, this is the thing. If I got these three ingredients, I can make a little dip on the side and I'll look like Martha Stewart and I can't be diddly, you know. These are just fun things people would love. It's stupid. But people go, that's funny. I want to watch and see what she's making tomorrow. I want to make that dish. Here's my dish. Let me share ideas with you. Yeah. They would love that, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's it's simple. That's a small And people strategy. here's what people ask me. They go, they go, Oh, Tammy, what does that have to agents ask me? What does that have to do with real estate? So nothing, therefore everything. Because if I'm talking about real estate, they're going to listen about this long. Yep. If they're not in the mood right now to buy real estate or sell real estate, but they will listen to me talk about cooking, my cats, my kitchen, the silly birds on my porch that are dive bombing me. And every fifth or 10th post is me showing my listing and I'm out there doing an open house. They're not going to forget. Yeah. But if all I talk about is that, they're going to keep scrolling. And that's what most realtors do. It's all real estate all the time and people are bored of it yeah, yeah. it's name on name on brain yeah it's right? like they the say, Gary Vee book too they say that people like um the mental bandwidth for like one realtor one dentist one contractor you know one one person in every profession yeah so we're just constantly fighting with other agents for that mental bandwidth but I think you're right I mean you have to just be that person that they see you know, every time they're in social media and it's name on brain recognition. And when they need an actual realtor, they'll reach out. Yeah. 
that's what works. I can tell you an example. I wish she was here today. Uh, my my cat, Princess Cocoa Beans. She's got over a hundred thousand followers <laughs> on social media. She's beautiful, uh, and uh, half on Instagram, half on Facebook. But most days she rides to the office with me, and I do a lot of drive videos while I'm. Which is, don't panic. I'm not in Jersey. I'm not in any of these places. We're on the Turnpike. I'm in Fredericksburg, Texas, going about fifteen on a back road to make it to the office. It's nothing. <laughs> A very small town. So I'm putting along. Coco's in my lap. I'm talking about whatever. I go through the McDonald's drive through get a Diet Coke. I say, everybody hang on. Got to get my Diet Coke. We keep talking. Real estate may or may not come up. If so, if it does, it's kind of like, hey, guys, got to head into the team training, training the team today on how to run a comparative market. Now, whatever. But that's it. It's got to be fun, the rest of it. But in about a 10-day period, two, three years ago, I will never forget, I had two come list me calls. For a two and a half million dollar property and a three point three million dollar property. Again, I'm in Texas. So that's crazy, right. right? Both of them, when I walked in, they didn't want to talk about how much real estate have you sold or show us your present. What they wanted to talk about was the cat. <laughs> the cat. They knew, liked, and trusted me because I'm part of their routine. And I had a gal the other day come in and go, Oh, I, no, I love watching the videos. And when I go out of town, my hairdresser says, turn on that Fredericksburg realtor. And let's listen to her talk in the car with the cat. <laughs> it's true. This is what we don't get. It just doesn't take that much. And I, I walked, my husband, Wes, walked in with me and I said, oh, so-and-so, this is Wes. She goes, Wes, I know you. Of course, they've never met. But I talk about Wes. She's seen the photos. The the blur of the, the reality, yep. perception is gone. And there was no one she was going to list with but the person with the cat and with the husband named Wes. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Vee wrote a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And that's essentially the same kind of theory, right? And the same thing that you said earlier on with the wedding photos and everybody on Facebook, when the attention was there, you just rolled in the real estate part of it. And one of the things that we respect and admire about you is how you were able to, when you transitioned into eXp, you were able to use, I, correct me if I'm wrong, did you use the same strategy for agent attraction? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all the same thing. Um, now, I need to do a little bit better and get on the phone and, and call a few more people directly because some of my very biggest, but, but they were people, they weren't cold calls. They were people I had a relationship with, right? right? So I reached out and uh, Mark Pattison, for one. Uh, David DeVoe is another great example. People I had a relationship. So I called and made a very genuine conversation with yeah. them because I knew them. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I talk about it. People know, but a lot of times, whether you're a listing agent, whether you are attracting agents to your team, whether you're attracting agents to EXP, to me, if we aren't careful, we, we could be commoditized and we could all be bottles of ketchup on the shelf. Mm. Your personality is what makes you the bottle that stands out. Because they could go, you know, you could put me, you can get me into the company. Who do I think I might enjoy actually hanging out with? Who might be willing to take my call? do whatever they can to help me, right? So usually so you're just building that rapport and that relationship. And how is that different from the lady that wants me to list her beautiful home versus the agent who wants to join the team versus the agent who I've had them go, you know what? I looked on YouTube and I listened to a lot about EXP and I just felt like you were telling it straight. I just felt like I could trust you. Yeah. Now someone else may look at me and go, you're not for me, but they may be thinking, hey, you're my style, Yeah. right? So we have to be our true genuine selves uh, be willing to be a little vulnerable, open up, share a little bit, and the people who are looking for you will find you. Yeah. You know, I get the the the, uh, the sense that you like to control the, like essentially in your businesses, you were controlling all the, uh, like the, the the retail spaces, you were controlling the B&B, you tried getting rid of the middle person. Being your own brokerage and getting into an EXP, how, did, how long did, were you thinking about EXP before you actually made the transition? And how did you relinquish that uh, need for control before you transitioned? Well, that's a, that is a great question. And it's kind of interesting. The shocking thing is I always laugh at people. I think that really want control and, or say it's an ego thing to have your own brokerage. Cause I'm like, no, uh, trust me on the B and B side, that thing is such a well old machine. I only darken the door if they really need me, they have got this. I don't want to be involved any more than they need me. So I don't, I am very much an 80% mm. good. 80% is good enough. Let's keep rolling, you know, kind of person on real estate on the brokerage side. I'm like, why on earth would it hurt your pride to not have your own brokerage? And I know that's a thing because I hear it constantly, but to me, it's weird um, <laughs> because I'm like, my name, absolute charm is the same. Our colors are the same. I have to correct our agents. Occasionally they slip and call me their broker. -uh, I'm your team leader. 
you know, our culture is the same. All we did is offload all the stuff that was lowest and worst use of my time. We want to focus on highest and best. Brokering deals is lowest and worst. Mm. And I have literally said, if the if my favorite things about EXP went away, if stock went away, if revenue share went away, healthcare, I still wouldn't leave. You could not pay me to start brokering deals again. The only reason I did it, I didn't want control. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah, We just started off as a brokerage and thought that's what you do. And once I learned about this, I would never go back. Same. And how long did it take me? Too long. But you know why? It, it wasn't, I think here's our problem. A lot of people came out of the franchise world or right, the large brokerage world. So they speak this language. Caps, I know what splits were because we started our brokerage team from day one. It was already kind of a, a, you know, a melding of that. But I didn't even know what caps meant. We had never lived in that world. Mm. So it was not just me and my husband joining. It was these 15 agents we had under us at that time and figuring out how does that all work? It was a difficult thing to get our mind around when we, I was like, so they pay me and they pay EXP and there's a cap. And what does this mean? It was blowing all of our minds because we just didn't speak the lingo. Yeah. Yeah. And so it took a long time to figure it out. Well, do the agents want to do it or do they not? The biggest lesson I've learned through my own experience, through helping others transition over has been, don't let the tail wag the dog. You've got to have confidence and understanding as a leader when you make a decision. If you're like, I don't know, I'm thinking about this thing. Who's going to follow that person off a bridge? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got to be like, no. I don't know what that even means. You're not even explaining it well. I don't want to do that. That's change. Why would I, why would they want to do that? Yeah. Why would they want to do that? Guaranteed they're going to go, mm. And what I find is people in the leadership position typically listen mostly to the person who tells them, you don't need to change anything. You're good the way you are because it's easier. Yeah. So they're waiting for the proof text of the person to say, no, don't do that. Yeah. Just stay the way we are. It's work. Yeah. Making a change is work. Yeah. Growth is work. That's actually a perfect transition. One of our favorite quotes, we heard this recently, is that most people tippy toe their way through life hoping that they make it safely to death. And that's by Earl Nightingale. And your book, Stop Waiting to Die, that's, I, we don't know what's in the book yet, but that title just kind of brought that up. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book, what it's about, what inspired you to write it? I am really proud of it. I spent four years on it. Not because you can tell I can yammer on about anything. I can also <laughs> write yammer on about anything. I've learned so many words today. <laughs> like so many yammer. Words, right? So many, so many new words. Every time I would sit down, I would write 2,500 words easily. The problem is four years ago, I thought the book was about starting a successful real estate team. So I went into the workshop. I outlined that. I did all the things. I got back. I had friends in real estate go at conferences go, oh, I thought it'd be about social media. And I was like, uh-oh, maybe I'm writing the wrong book. So I started writing about that a little bit more. And then I had friends go, I thought it'd be about your life, how you met Wes and built this into holistic. I'm not a realtor, but I want to read the book. So it just kept morphing. So pro tip, figure out what your book's about. <laughs> <laughs> We're still trying to figure so out what this podcast is about. So we, we understand loud and clear. You know, right? So I had all this great content, but then I was having to add sections, move stuff around. The story wasn't that different, but that's why it took so long. And I, I recorded the audio book last month. And that was, if you think about it, the first time I've actually read the book. Mm. Every other time I read the book, it was looking to add a paragraph, change a word, take a hyphen out. So when it's an audio book for a day and a half, I read it out. Now, don't, don't worry. The book, everyone has read it so far, the, the pre PDFs has told me it's about a four hour read. So it's four hours, but that takes days when you're doing an audio, which is a whole another subject. It's very interesting. And so that's the first time I read it and I'm very happy with it. Stop Waiting to Die talks about how so many people get to an age. For some people, it's way too young. Even in your 50s, 60s, 70s, they start counting the days to retirement. You know, I'm a big fan of Gary Vee and I, he and I think so much alike on so many things, except the cussing. I'm from the mm -hmm. South and we, I'm gonna do that. Everything else he does, I love. And I love that he says, if you're 70, 
Odds are, barring something unusual, you have so much time. You have time for another career, maybe two. But we've been conditioned, well, it's too late for me. I need to just start thinking about what, you know, retirement. And uh, my first husband, and I've had three, and that alone is shocking, being the conservative that I am. So that's part of the book is all the mm. stuff I went through that was never going to happen to me. But his parents, God love them, they were probably my age now. And she was a secretary and he was a janitor. And I remember going to visit them and all they talked about, I'm not kidding, they had numbered the days until they could get Social Security. Mm. And I thought, what a pathetic existence. If you are that unhappy, stop whatever you're doing. Find a way. Live in a tent if you got it, but start over. You got one at bat in life. Stop thinking, that's it for me. It's all over. Yeah. You have so many restarts. And, you know, I said, God works in mysterious ways. If I hadn't taken four years to write the book, which is ridiculous, I wouldn't have been able to share my husband Wes's restart. Mm. This book goes through all the business restarts, the hardships, not glamour. When I'm uh, to start the quilt shops, I moved into a 1961 Avion trailer. And for y'all that don't know, that's an Airstream knockoff. Mm. So it's not even moving to a silver Airstream. It was an <laughs> Avion 1961 with no bathroom. So we had a little shop. So 3 a.m., you got to go to the bathroom. You got to get out, unlock the shop and go to the bathroom. That's how I started. I left law to move into that, mm. to po'boy it, to start a business. And if you aren't willing to do that, if you want to be fancy from day one, you, you better go work for somebody because yep. you cannot be an entrepreneur. So my husband now, so I've had all of these restarts the book goes through, but it ends up, you'll love this. My husband is 58 years old and Last all, he's a naturally very talented artist and he got it from his mother, but he goes, I got to support a family. I'm not going to be a starving artist. All this. Last August, I said, you know what? Let's send you to a one month workshop in Florence, Italy. You deserve this. I'm not going. You deserve no distractions and to just immerse yourself in your art for a month. This is all about you in the home of Michelangelo. Mm. And so we sent him and he loved it and he was crushing it as usual. And just, they were like, who are you? And uh, where are you from? What's going on here? They asked him, would you consider joining the master's program? And I said, well, did they ask everybody? He goes, no, I was the only one out of all the people in the 30 day workshops that they asked because they'd seen what I was doing. And he called me, he goes, this is crazy. He goes, it sounds amazing, but guess what? Then I asked how long it was. I'm like, oh, you know, a year. And he laughed and I laughed. I'm like, that's crazy talk. So I told my daughter, I said, could you believe it would be it's so, so, Makes you feel good, right? Yeah. It's so empowering to be invited to join the Masters in Visual Arts. I go, yeah, but it's a year, so that's stupid. We're not doing that. And she goes, what is wrong with you? And I was like, uh-oh, remember, you might train your kids too well, right, yeah. to, to be you and then some? Yep. She goes, what's wrong with you? Of course you should do it. She said, you can afford, if, if you need to go see him to visit, he can come home once or twice. You will never get this chance again. I text him. I think you maybe should do it. He's like, wait, what? Are you serious? What? Call me, call me. And long story short, um, next month, he will be coming home after spending 11 months in Florence, Italy. He has already graduated, earned his master's in visual arts. He is killing it, planning to come home and start a full-time art career. His work has just blown people away. He's doing a full-size bronze matador sculpture that wow. is almost, the clay is almost done. And they keep saying, how much sculpting have you done? He goes, well, I used to do these little heads. And I would do them on the plane. I'd fly. They're like, so you went from that to a six foot tall sculpture. That's awesome. That's a restart. So the name of the book is Stop Waiting to Die, A Guide to Mastering the Art of the Restart. That's nice. If you think you're going to go get hired by IBM and get a gold watch and work there 50 years and go to the rocking chair, that doesn't happen anymore. And it shouldn't be scary. It should be exciting. See that all of us have done these twists, turns. If you're keeping doors open, and you can go this way or can go that way, this is an amazing time to be alive. These options were not available when I was born. Yeah, yeah. You better hope you got hired on somebody good and lived. Now, if you're 73, you got a minimum of one new career. He's 58, he's a baby. Yeah, he's starting over as an artist. Heck yeah, why not? That's awesome, I love it. And it's gonna be available for pre-order or is it gonna be available for just actual just order? directly it's interesting what the publisher said is it is pre-order but they said please don't they said june 13th june 14th that's what we're aiming for they said amazon looks mostly at orders and reviews and a short period of time got it 
Well, so interestingly, they said pre-orders dragged out is not as good as somebody going on. I said, you can remember June 13th, like it's unlucky, but it's going to be lucky. Lucky 13. That's the day the book is going to be out on Amazon and then forevermore, uh, Lord willing. And the audio will come out in six to eight weeks after that. Should we do for Tammy what we did for Jordan Cohen and uh, yeah. Jen Gottlieb? Let's do it. So we've had a few other authors on the podcast recently. Jordan Cohen, number one REMAX agent worldwide. Yep. Wow. Jen Gottlieb, she's a keynote public speaker. Yes. Awesome, powerful woman. We bought 10 of their books, right? So we're going to buy 10 of yours, June 13th. Awesome. Thank you so much. There's one catch, though. Yes. Okay. We get them all sent to you, and we'd like you to sign them so that when we could give them to our people, it's got your 100%. name. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I would love to do that. Awesome. I would love to. Well, we'd love to support you. The book we have sounds... to get a cat paw next to it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all don't even laugh. I literally have this stamp that has Princess Coco's face. That's literally a photograph of Princess Coco, <laughs> and it's a stamp. But uh, the problem with this is it had uh, some questions. You know, it's probably coming out. Of, I don't know where when I was ordering this thing. And it said, put in the notes if you want the body or just the face. And the only note was the memo. And it says face only. So this says Coco face, face only. only. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of screwed it up, but I got to start over. <laughs> they literally like, face only. Happy birthday. Insert name here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. We'll do that and we'll have our people reach out. We would love to collaborate with you on, on social and, and be able to push out the book that much more. Happy so. to help in any way. And I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'm kind of doing this in a mom and pop way, but I've sent it out to, I asked people who would be willing because they suggested this to like pre-read a PDF and be ready to review on that day. And I've had 180 people that I've sent the PDF that are supposed to be ready and waiting. I was like, this is a grassroots and it's just made my day how many have written and said, this is exactly what I needed. I just signed up for my PhD program. I knew I needed to do it and I'm that. not stopping I'm doing it. And it just, just makes my day. But when people say this spoke to me, it, every one of them that's written me didn't talk in terms of what, anything about me. Yeah. They talked about how they related. They go, that spoke to me and what I need. And I was, yes, this wasn't supposed to be about me. It's about how take what I've done and how's this going to help you? Awesome. And every review I've gotten from them has been about that. Awesome. Th thank you so much for your time and consideration and joining us today. I think people will find this uh, wildly impactful. Yeah. I think people are really going to be excited to, to get their hands on the book. Yeah. What's the best way for someone to reach out to collaborate or just reach out to you? So Instagram will let you have more. So Tammy Pack Talks. I'm on just about everything is Tammy Pack Talks. Because as y'all know, I like to talk. I <laughs> love it. Awesome. <laughs> well, we'll make sure we put that in there and we'll get it set up. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.